Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wa man ahsanu qawla min man dhahila Allahi wa amilu salihaw. Wa qawla inna ni minal muslimin. Rabbi shalli sadri. Wa yisalli amri. Wa ahlul uqdata min lisani hafka wa kawli. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, and the Peace TV Chinese, as well as the viewers on my social media platforms, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, the Twitter, and the Alida platform. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. I welcome all the viewers to this program. Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 8, Session 4. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compassion religion, or any question which a non-Muslim may have posed and you are unable to reply, or any question or attack that you find on the media, if you require a clarification, this is the opportunity. You're most welcome to ask your questions on any of the social media platforms, but the best and the highest chances of it being replied if you ask as a subscriber on the Alida platform, and the next is as a text message on the WhatsApp. You can mention your question in brief, along with your name, your profession, your city and country, as a text message to the WhatsApp number plus six zero. Double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat, plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. Inshallah, we'll take the first question. <coughs> the first question is from the Alida platform. Vireshappa, a hospital attendant from Karnataka, India. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. I am a reverted Muslim, alhamdulillah. My question is why Peace TV is not broadcasting through air, radio or FM? Because I think it is very easy to access radio than TV. So please telecast Peace TV on radio or FM so that people all over the world may inshallah hear the true guidance for humanity. May Allah reward you with goodness. This is my important question to you, sir. Please, 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 please. Fifteen times, please. Answer me. MashaAllah. May Allah bless you. May he accept all your duas. Please make duas for me to do more ibadah to Allah, to be a good believer and a da'i. May Allah guide us to straight path. Ameen. I am a subscriber of Al Hidayah. Brother Virashappa, who is a revert, he asked a question on the Al Hidayah platform that why don't we telecast Peace TV on the FM radio because he feels that it's more easy to access and more people will watch. Normally when you broadcast from the satellite, it can, it can be of two types. It is either audio broadcast like for example on the radio or it's a video broadcast like a television. The video broadcast is called a telecast. You cannot telecast on the radio, so just to correct you. But coming to your basic question that why don't we broadcast the audio signals of the Peace TV on the radio FM? 
The point to be noted is that, but naturally, the reach of the satellite is multiple times more. The reach of the television satellite is multiple times more than a radio. Yes, there was a time when radio was number one in the world, but a few decades earlier, when the television came, people thought that radio would be obsolete, but alhamdulillah, yet the radio is there. It has its own importance. But as time has kept on changing, but natural, earlier the television telecast was very expensive. It was beyond the budget of most of the people. Therefore, radio was an option, a cheaper option. Now, alhamdulillah, both have become cheaper. But today, depending upon your reach and your popularity, you have to take your decision. And according to me, today, the, la the best media today in the world, which has the maximum reach, after all the advancement till today also, it is the television satellite channels. Yes, social media is catching up. The gap between the two is decreasing. But yet, as per today, 2021, according to my research, people may agree, may not agree, the television satellite channel is the best. And especially if you have a large viewership, the best and the cheapest method is telecasting through a satellite channel throughout the world. The radio FM today yet has its own benefits. I do agree with you that the reach of the radio in terms of people receiving radio signal is much more easier than receiving the television signals. For example, in India today, maybe 99% of India can receive the radio signal. The television satellite signals is much lesser. The analog is much more, maybe more than 90%, but the satellite digital is much less. I do agree with you. But today, people watch more of the television as compared to the radio. But radio has its own niche, especially if it's music, it's much more heard because people who love music, they like that. But seeing the genre of an Islamic entertainment channel, yet I would feel that satellite is the best amongst all. And now the audio broadcast has got various other options. You have the internet, you have streaming. Now this on the internet and streaming, you have both the options. We have audio, we have video also. So that's the reason the options of audio and video have increased. So seeing all the various scenario, if you have the budget, today I would recommend that the best is utilize the satellite media. You'll have the maximum reach at an effective cost. If you don't have budget at all, then the cheapest would be the social media. You can do it for free. You can spend hundreds and thousands of dollars. You can spend millions of dollars a month. You can spend much more than that. Also. So it depends upon what level do you want to reach on the social media. Radio also has its own advantage. For example, if you're driving in the car and if you're in a traffic jam, people like listening to radio. And in the Islamic genre, the effective mode for radio broadcast is maybe the Kerat. More people would love to hear a Kerat, maybe a recitation of the Quran while they're traveling in a car. But if possible, you should try and use as many modes as possible. So best would be on the satellite channel as well as the radio FM as well as on the internet and various methodology. But as far as the radio FM is concerned, there are drawbacks in getting the license. It's not as easy as that. And especially in India, the Indian government, especially since we have the new government in the last few years, it, I do not know of any single Islamic satellite television channel which has got an official broadcasting permission, except there's one Shia channel. But in the mainstream Islamic channel, I don't know of a single. Even PST have applied and they had declined because it's a channel that is propagating the haq, the deen of Islam. Similarly, I doubt whether the Indian government would give permission for a radio FM to be launched in India. 
And the advantage of Radio FM is it is more of a local, if you want to reach a particular city or a particular state in that particular language or a particular country. The international radio broadcasts that is there, that's not that popular. The Radio FM, which is localized, is more popular. It has its advantages, though it's not as widely watched as the television, but it has its own pros and cons. We tried. We could not get the permission in India. And we tried even in certain other countries. There are too many hassles. But natural, it is much cheaper than the satellite. So best is to have on the satellite and the radio and the internet. So because of the various problems that are there, we chose the best, the largest, that is the satellite. And we also there on the internet, on the various social media platform. But the satellite reach, after the technology has increased, it is much more cheaper, especially if you have a large viewership. If on the satellite your viewership is small, it becomes very expensive per person. But if you have a large viewership, especially like what Peace TV has, it has more than 100 million viewers, then the effective cost is very cheap. Depending upon which country you are doing it, for example, when we used to telecast in USA, one is the reach that anyone who has the dish can watch. One is the potential viewership. It's coming in your house, you may watch or may not watch. So that time maybe our potential viewership was 100 million in USA. But the practical viewership was hardly 1 or 2 million. Actual viewership. And the cost of one person actually viewing Peace TV, it was per year approximately 3 to 5 dollar per person watching full year. The same cost if we compared in UK, where our viewership was about 2-3 million. The cost per person was approximately $1 per year per person. Same if you compare in Asia, in the Indian subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and the other countries, our cost of telecast was in $1, 50 people could watch for the full year. That means it is so cheap. 50 people watching full year and you are spending only one US dollar. So comparatively, USA is about 250 times more expensive than the Indian subcontinent. And UK is about 50 times more expensive than the Indian subcontinent. Because the reach is wide, once you telecast, irrespective of whether one person is watching, or 100 people are watching, or 1 million are watching, or 100 million are watching, the cost of telecast, the broadcast is the same. Unlike while streaming, the more people that stream, more expensive it is. Depending if you want a low quality or a high quality, and the cost of streaming, if you want a high quality, somewhat like Netflix, it's very expensive. So if you want to stream, like Peace TV Network, Alhamdulillah, according to 2016 estimate, it had more than 200 million viewers, similar to what Netflix has now. So the cost of streaming on the quality of Netflix on Amazon would be 100 times more expensive than what we are doing on the Peace TV. But naturally, the Netflix has the advantage of revenue and they can do what you want, video on demand. So everything has its pros and cons. For that reason, we launched the Al Hidayah, which is a different platform. It's a streaming platform and it's a subscription based. But I do agree with you, brother Virishappa, that radio will increase the reach. But the headache involved and not getting the permission, we didn't really go into it. But it has its own pros and cons. But as far as the Islamic edutainment channel like Peace TV is concerned, the benefit will not be that much as compared to the money spent. That is the reason we didn't really go into the audio broadcast of the Peace TV channels. Hope that answers the question. The next question, <coughs> Assalamu alaikum sir, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Muhammad Hafiz. I am a student from Bijni, Assam, India. Should I go for the career then, should I go for the career first, then start the dawa work or start giving dawa from now and be a full time dai? Please answer. A uh, question on a similar topic is asked by Naseem 
from Bangladesh. I want to educate my son in Islamic education. Please tell me the names of some Islamic educational institutions inside and outside Bangladesh from which my child can acquire knowledge of Quran and Hadith. I want my child to acquire the highest knowledge of Islam in the light of Quran and Sunnah. As far as the first question was asked, that should I continue as far as my career is concerned or start doing dawah and become a full-time dai? As you may have heard my answer in several uh, earlier questions and in lectures, that as per the Quran, the best profession for a Muslim is that of a dai. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusilla, chapter number 41, verse number 33, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ ضَعِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَمِنُ صَالِحَوْمْ وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of the Lord, who works righteousness and says that I'm a Muslim. So according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best profession is that of a dai. And for more details, you can refer to my other answers. So if you ask me, that if you want, should I continue a normal career or should I do dawah and become a full-time dai? Of course, as far as the akhirah is concerned, the best profession is that of a dai. No other profession, no other profession can come anywhere close to a dai. But naturally, Islamic scholar and dai, these are the highest level. And what was the profession of our beloved Prophet Muhammad He was the messenger of God. And after the messengership has ended, a prophet was the last and final messenger. It is the dais and the scholars who continue to spread the message of the deen. It is the best. I'll merge and continue with the first answer with the second question. The second question opposed that he's from Bangladesh. He wants to give his son the highest education in Islam. He wants me to name some Islamic educational institutions outside Bangladesh and within Bangladesh where he can educate his child to the best Islamic educational levels. The brother didn't pose, he didn't tell me what was the age of his child, whether he's talking about school, whether he's talking about college, about university. I'll try and cover some of it. As far as the education system in Bangladesh is concerned, I have not been to Bangladesh, I'm not done research, so I'm not the right person to tell you which are the best schools or universities in Bangladesh. As far as the schooling is concerned, I can advise you that see to it that you find a good Islamic education school, preferably if it's an Islamic international school, it will be the best. See which is the best available in your country and try and enroll. See to, see to it that the school is based on lines of Quran and Sunnah. As far as I'm concerned, you may be aware that uh, I started a school in the year 2000, in the year 2001, that's about 20 years back the Islamic International School in Mumbai, also Islamic International School in Chennai. And Alhamdulillah, the main purpose of that school was education for both the worlds. Educate your children for this world as well as the Akhirah. But naturally, more stress was paid on the Akhirah. And we wanted to see to it that when the child passes the 12th standard A level, he has the basic knowledge that is required for a Muslim for the world affairs. And I felt that IGCSC, the Cambridge board, once you pass A level equivalent to 12th standard or, or the HSC, higher secondary school, a person gets fairly good knowledge of the worldly subjects. So if a person passes A levels of the Cambridge or the IGCSC or the HSC or the 12th standard as we call, he fairly gets a good knowledge of the various subjects that are required for the worldly knowledge. If it's an Islamic international school which is attached to a syllabus of the Cambridge, it's very good, or some international syllabus which gives a good education. Simultaneously, educating a child with the basics of Islam, then about Quran, Hadith, Sharia, Fiqh, like what we had in our school, Islamic international school. And Alhamdulillah, it was a very successful school, mashallah. We had the main medium of instruction was English. And Arabic. So if you can find a school whose main language of instruction, two languages I believe are most important. One is Arabic, the language of the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And second, 
is the English language, which is, which is an international language, which is required for a person to dawa. And third, maybe the local language. If you are in Bangladesh, can be Bengali. If you are in India, can be Hindi, depending which state you are coming from. But the two main languages are Arabic and English. And our education was mainly in these two languages. And we thought to it that the selected children, about more than one third, who we felt can do his, they finish his by the time they reach standard five. And from fifth to ten, they did Moraja, so that they become a Hafiz, which, uh, so that the person can become a Hafiz who not only memorized the Quran, but can repeat it very easily without any revision. Then Arabic, we wanted to be, make it strong besides English, so that both these languages become as good as their mother tongue. And we achieved success to a great level by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that, mashallah, that the students that graduated from a school, they could speak fluent Arabic, they knew the basics of the Sharia, and it was a very successful model until just five years back, as you may be aware, that the new government, the BJP government, was not very happy with the successful activity we were doing in terms of Dawa, in terms of schools, and because of that, we had to shut that school. We had one school in Bombay, we had one school in Chennai. I do not know of any other school in India or anywhere else in the world that I visited. I visited hundreds of Islamic schools. In India, I did not come across any school that was even 5% close to the level of IS. And internationally, I did not know of any school which even came 10% close to what Islamic International School was in terms of Tarbiya, in terms of having a dual language, in terms of giving the knowledge of Islam and the worldly education together. So my advice to you would be, the brother was the question from India, that try and find the best available Indian school if you are studying in a school. And in Bangladesh, the best available school that you have. Or if you know of any school abroad where you want to send your son, that's an option. After you finish the A-levels from an Islamic international school, my advice would be that if you want to dedicate and make your child as a dai or make your child in the field of Islamic knowledge and you ask me for the names of good Islamic institutions. As far as Bangladesh is concerned, I'm, no, I'm aware that there are a few Islamic institutions, the Islamic University, which is there in uh, Chittagong. It's there in some other parts of Bangladesh, but I'm not too much aware. I did meet the principals or the deans of the institute when I traveled to Makkah, but I'm not aware of the quality. But as a general rule, what we realize that when a Muslim studies in the institution abroad, and one of the best Islamic institute as far as studying the knowledge of Islam is concerned according to me, is Imam Muhammad bin Saud Islamic University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. It's one of the best. The other good institutes are the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia, as well as Umul Qura. And there are various other Islamic universities and general universities in Saudi Arabia, many. But these three are the most prominent ones. If you study in an Islamic university where the, where the instruction, the language of instruction is Laga Fusa, it's the best. You have other Islamic institutes in other parts of the world. You have in Yemen, you have in Mauritania, etc. You also have good Islamic institutes in, in Qatar. You have uh, Hamad bin Khalifa, Hamad bin Khalifa University, you have the Qatar University, you have in Dubai, you have in Sharjah, the Sharjah Islamic University, and in the Gulf countries. But the one that I named, the first three, I, be, I believe one of the best. So if you can go to an Arab country and see to it that the institute you join is based on Quran and Sunnah, that would be the best. If you are not able to get, and it's, you can try, you can apply, and most of these institutes, they have scholarship, but it's not easy getting in. You have to work hard, you have to apply, you have to keep on applying many times, you have to take references, and there are chances that you can get, but you have to work hard, not just apply once. So there are more than 30, 40 Islam universities you can apply in the Arab countries. Apply to all, as many as you can. Go on the net, Google these one that are named are the better ones. 
The next option can be if you want to study in a non-Arab country, the International Islamic University of Malaysia, that's in Kuala Lumpur in Gompak, it's a very good option. After the Arab country that you have, if you want to go to non-Arab countries, a good Islamic university will be the IIUM, International Islamic University of Malaysia. It's a good option, but natural, here we have a dual medium of instruction in this university. It is English and Arabic. So besides, even if you want to do the worldly subjects, whether it be law, whether it be science, whether it be computer, it is compulsory in this university that you should learn at least the basics of Arabic, not a very high level. And if you want to do your graduation or a post-graduation in the IIUM, in the faculty of revealed knowledge, then you have two options either in Arabic or in English. And the Arabic, you cannot compare with the Arabic of Jamit al-Imam in Riyadh or of Madinah University, but yet it is, alhamdulillah, compared to the non-Arab country, it is good. But compared to the Arab country, it will not be that level. Yes, they have teachers from all over the world. They have teachers from the Arab world and they have selected the best of teachers from different parts of the world. So it's a good option. And if you cannot get scholarship in the Gulf countries or the Arab countries, the fees in IIUM Malaysia is reasonable. It's quite cheap. Because if you have to pay the fees in the Gulf countries, it's very expensive, multiple times more expensive. So comparative, the fees of IIUM, IIUM is cheap. So this is the next option that you have. I am not too much favor of studying Islamic graduation and post-graduation in the Indian subcontinent. That can be the last option. And But naturally, in the Indian subcontinent, I would feel that the Islamic universities in Pakistan is better. For example, the Islamic University of Islamabad. After IIUM, I would say that's also a good university. But in India, doing from the Indian universities, the level will not be as good. That can be the last option, but I would not advise you to go to the Bombay University or the normal education of the government. Yes, for example, Arabic in Lucknow in Nadwa is good, mashallah, very good, as compared to the other madrasas. But generally, the level of Islamic education in Arabic, etc., in the Gulf country is the best. And I can tell this why, as you may be aware, that Alhamdulillah, the Islamic Research Foundation and the associated organization, our full umbrella, we had more than 500 employees, 500 full-time paid employees. And amongst these 500 full-time paid employees, there were about approximately about 70 of these employees, there they were graduates, postgraduates and PhDs from Islamic universities. Out of which about 40 to 45 were from the Indian universities and about 25 were from the foreign universities. And we had from different Islamic institutions, I don't want to name them, but we had from variety from all over India, you know, we had 40, so maybe from at least 10, 15 top Islamic universities. So we knew what the level was there. And plus, we had 25 from the foreign university. This is at one given time. But over the span of 10, 15 years, you know, some staff stayed for three, two years, some for three, some for four, some for five. So all put together, we had more than hundreds that we, were, that we interacted with. Maybe more than 50 from foreign universities and more than 100 from the Indian universities. I would say, and the majority we had, maybe among from the foreign universities, maybe more than 75% were from the Islamic University of Medina. Then we had from Jamit al Imam, we had from Mulkara, we had from Al Hazar, and various foreign universities. But national the level from the Southeast University was the best in terms of Logafasa, and more Indians could easily get admission into the Islamic University of Medina, therefore we had more from there. The level was much 
higher as compared to the graduates of the Islamic universities in India. That is the reason the school that we had, the teachers that we had, where, where it comes to teaching Arabic, all of them were from foreign university, except for one from Nadwa, he was very good. But all the Arabic language were taught by the graduates and postgraduates and PhDs from the foreign universities, mainly from Saudi Arabia. And whereas the other part were his, Tilawat, Tajweed, and the other parts were taken from the graduates and the postgraduates from, from the Indian universities. But let me tell you one thing, that as far as education is concerned, yes, if you want to see to it that you become a dai, my advice would be that see to it that you put yourself in a good, good, put your child into a good Islamic university. But let me tell you, as far as practical dawah is concerned, number one most important is the help of Allah. And your striving is important. What you gain knowledge in the university is good for your basics. But attending the durus, the lectures and the discourses of the scholars is very important. That's the reason when a person goes to study in Medina or in Riyadh or in Makkah, he has an opportunity besides learning in the Islamic University, if he's studying in the Islamic University in Medina, he can go to the Masjid al Nabi and hear the, hear the durus or there are many halakas that take place in Medina of different top scholars. They can attend that if he's in Makkah, he can go to the Haram or attend other scholars or if he's in Riyadh, the Riyadh has a better option because the Qubar Ulma are there, the top Ulma of Saudi Arabia are there. So very well he can attend the lectures, the sessions, and each scholar has, some have 5, some have 10, some have 15 sessions in a week, and there are plenty of them. So besides studying in the university, studying in the university is good. You, you get a degree, you get a qualification, it will be good for getting a job, but for practical dawah, Studying under the scholars one-to-one -one, or attending the durs is more important than what you study in the university. What you study in the university, you read, you pass the examination, that's it. Most of it is forgotten unless you revise it. So my advice would be similarly, what you study in colleges, what you learnt in science or in arts or in commerce, that's the basic, unless you do not implement it after you pass and do your internship, you will not excel in that field. So same thing with Islamic studies. So most important is that if you do from a good Islamic institution, at least your bachelor, that is very important. And then get involved into practical, join a dawah organization, which is practically, practically involved in the field of dawah, or talking to non-Muslims, or a research department. Otherwise, many of the Indians, once they pass, then they do a job of translation from Arabic to Urdu, or Arabic to English. I mean, that's not the reason why you went to an Islamic university. You get there, you get a good job, you get good salary. So unfortunately, when the Indian people from the Indian subcontinent, whether it be India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they go to these institutions in the Gulf country because it's free. Then they get uh, a kafala, they get every month paid, which is good for them. When they come back, few are involved in the field of dawa, unfortunately. If your main purpose is to make your child a dai or an Islamic person of good Islamic knowledge or in the field of Islamic teaching, etc., see to it that after he passes graduation, he gets involved practically with some dawa organization or with some scholars. Then, of course, you can go ahead. You can do your master's, you can do your PhD, but the most important is your bachelor's. Doing your bachelor's from a good, reputed institution is the most important. Because when you're doing your bachelor's, and I'm talking about bachelor's on-site, I'm not talking about bachelor's online. Online on the internet, online on the internet, you have got various universities. Please, the level of a good, reputed, on-site university like Islam University of Medina, or Jamatul Imam from Riyadh, you cannot compare with any online degree, please. Yes, if a student is excellent and he has the knack, he has the passion, he can benefit from these online universities. I'm not saying don't join them, but you cannot compare the level. Please don't deceive yourself. Attending physically, meeting the scholars one-to-one -one is something different. The online university, the level of the 
scholars that teach on the online university generally, you cannot compare with the on-site university. The teachers that teach in the Medina, they are of the scholarly level. And the online universities, I hardly know. Maybe for a short time some scholars may be coming. But most of the ones that I know, you cannot compare the level at all. One to one is something different. That may be the last resort if you don't have anything to do and you are at home and you are stuck, then you can join uh, an online university. The levels are different. In the online university, among the one that I know, it is the IOU, the, the Islamic Online University. The name has changed the International Online University. Uh, that was done by Dr. Bilal Phillips, the one that's available. There are other ones that are there, that is the KIU, Knowledge Islamic University, that by Sheikh Saad Nasr Shetri. There are many, but that level that you get in the on-site universities like Islamic University of Medina, Jamut al-Imam, Umur Qura is something different. So after you pass your bachelor's, I would advise you to join a, a DAW organization or get involved in a scholars and simultaneously do masters. Now when you're doing masters, half of the time is the personal research and 50% or less than 50% is actually studying on-site or maybe one-third. So even giving less than half your time, you can complete your masters. Some universities take two and a half years, some three, some take four. So while you are involved in practical dawa, you can do your masters. And if time permits you, you can even continue your PhD, depending in which subject you are doing your PhD, depending what your liking is. But natural, I prefer that if you are in the field of dawa, I would prefer Sharia, doing bachelor's in Sharia and master's in PhD. The next would be tafsir of the Quran. If someone has a liking for the Quran, then okay, tafsir of Quran is good. Then the hadith is there. So these are the few which are on the better knowledge for doing da'wah. One is the sharia. Next would be tafsir of the Quran. Third would be hadith. These three. There are other things. Usul al-deen. Then there is da'wah. So when they talk about da'wah, most of these bachelors, they're talking about da'wah to Muslims, not da'wah to non-Muslims. There are some courses like comparative religion in IIUM. There are comparative religion courses even in, in the Saudi universities. But that level is different. Because I've met some of the students or some of the people who have passed their PhD in comparative religion. But when you actually talk to them about the practical dawah to be done to a non-Muslim, it is very shallow. Unless the person has practical knowledge of joining a DAO organization. That's the reason for practical DAO, you have to get involved with people who are scholars, who are dais, who are experienced, or join an Islamic organization. That will really improve your skills, not just doing a graduation. So my advice would be, after you pass the graduation, see where they're involved, and simultaneously do your masters. If you want high level, do PhD. You can do one PhD, you can do two PhD, as long as the person is young and can take it. And so that, but these degrees are only good for the world, may not be useful for the Akhira unless you implement it. You may get a good job, you may get a good job of a professor or a good post, or if you do Islamic finance, you get an Islamic, uh, Islamic bank. But practically, if you want to utilize it, it is a practical knowledge sitting with people who are involved in the field, whether they experience duats or, or with experience, they are scholars. This is very important. So this last part, practically, that is the reason everyone that, that I know that we had at any given time 60, 70 graduates, postgraduates, and PhDs. But were they good guys? I'm sorry to say. We had other people in organization who were engineers, who were just bachelors in science, and they were multiple times better than people who were graduates from the Islamic University of Medina. Why? Because they may not be having that passion until they came and did our course of Dawah training program. So we had a course only for the Medina graduates. And once they did that course, then they were multiple times more effective. So graduating from a good university is one thing, but putting into practice is another thing. That is the reason that our Duats in the research department of Islamic Research Foundation, who were normal graduates, they were paid double then what we used to pay, then what we used to pay a person who is a bachelor from the Islamic University of Medina. He may have the knowledge of deen, 
But when you ask him a question, he may not be able to reply on the comparative religion. He may be able to reply something on fiqh, that's it. So if you want a practical person involved in the field of dawah, unless, yes, the best would be graduate from a good university like Islamic University of Medina or Umul Qura or Jamal al Imam and get involved in an Islamic organization, which is practically in the field of dawah. Get attached to a person who's experienced die or a scholar and then utilize your knowledge what you had learned in the university and then learn the techniques then it would be superb just getting a degree is not sufficient for you to be a dai yes you get the qualification you can be a teacher that's it but practically moving hearts practically so therefore everyone who passes from the islam in Medina is not a good speaker Everyone that die, the percentage that are actually dies are very small. That is the reason if your aim is to be a die, get the knowledge from this university and get attached to an Islamic organization, get attached to a scholar, get attached to a Dai who is experienced and implement what you have learned, that would be the best. Hope this answers in short because this question was asked many times and I kept on postponing because I know it would take time. So this was in short how you can see to it that you make your child if your aim is to make him a die or Islamic personality this was in brief hope that answers the question we have on the Facebook Ibrahim Khan Mudassir Muzaffar Bhatt Zubair Ishaq, Atikur Rahman, Atik, Imtiaz Siyam, Assalamu Alaikum Sir, Wa Alaikum Salam, Anamul Haq, Malik Qasim, Malik Qasim, Muhammad Rasul, Love from Bangladesh, I love you too, Asim Sharif Shariyar, Zubair Ahmad Naim, Zahid Islam, Nazir Shuwo, Muhammad Jomir, Zahid Cox, Muhammad Kurban Ali, Ruma Akhtar, Assalamu Alaikum Alaikum Salam. Many of them are doing dua, they do dua to you too. Dua for you too. On the YouTube, we have Noman Yusuf. We have Marziya Hasnat, Khan, Shofi Alam, Ajum Chakma, Irfan Fayyaz Mullah, Marziya Hasnat, Lightning Foundation, Khushbu, Assalamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salam. Arsiyan Manzoor, Marziya Hasnat, The Legend Daud, Zubayad Islam, all are wishing Assalamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum Salam, and I pray for all of you too, you do pray for me too. question on the Alida platform just came a few minutes back by Buddha Dev Das he is a student from Murshidabad India he is a subscriber of the Alida platform he writes dear sir what is your thinking about those who died as committing shirk <clears throat> what is positive opinion for them Our non-Muslim brother asked a question that what is the opinion of a person who has died while doing shirk? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear cut in the Quran. 
very explicitly Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 48 as well as Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 116 Allah says if Allah pleases he may forgive any sin but he will never forgive the sin of shirk for anyone who has committed shirk has gone astray far has committed a heinous sin so based on these two verses of the Quran the only sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive if he dies as a mushrik is shirk if he's alive if he does shirk and if he asks for forgiveness inshallah Allah will forgive you do shirk a thousand times you ask forgiveness as long as you ask for forgiveness before you die or until the time of death has come because there's a verse in the Quran in Surah Yunus chapter number 10 where Pharaoh, Pharaoh he while he was chasing Moses peace be upon him Moses parted the sea he followed him and after Moses he crosses the sea the sea again comes back to normal and Pharaoh, Pharaoh is about to drown when the death has already approached him then he says I believe in the Lord in the Allah of Moses it was too late when the time of death has come when the moment of death has come then if you say the shahada or then if you say I believe in Allah it will be too late so as long as you ask for forgiveness and you stop your shirk before dying or minutes before the last time of death has come Allah will forgive you so if a person dies as a mushrik as a person who associate partners to God or a person while doing idol worship then for him there is no hope except the hellfire and there are several verses in the Quran that if a person dies as a mushrik he will remain in hell forever in Jahannam forever Khalidina fiha abada forever this is the only sin where if a person dies without asking for forgiveness Allah will not accept any other sin he may do murder he may do zina he may rob if Allah wants Allah will forgive him may forgive him if he pleases but the sin of shirk he'll never forgive that's the reason in Islam the two criteria for anyone to accept Islam is number one is agreeing that there is no God but Allah and you should not worship anyone besides the true God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you should believe in the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him so as far your question is concerned my dear non-Muslim brother is that I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah give you hidayah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you guidance and see to it that you accept the faith of Islam and you believe that there is only one God and no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah if you have any particular queries you are most welcome to contact through the Alidaya platform and inshallah I will try my level best to clarify any misconception that you have hope that answers the question there's a question that came on the YouTube that can I pray for non-Muslims to give them to give to can I pray to Allah for giving hidayah to non-Muslims this question is from Shahanara Islam on the YouTube yes you can very well pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give hidayah to the non-Muslim that is the best dua you can give to a non-Muslim whether you have a non-Muslim friend a non-Muslim colleague or non-Muslim teacher the best dua you can do for a non-Muslim is pray to Allah to give hidayah and that's what the Prophet also when he addressed letters to non-Muslim he said may Allah give you guidance that is the best but if anyone dies as a mushrik if he dies as an unbeliever then you cannot pray for his maqfarat you cannot pray to Allah that give him jannah that is forbidden and there was in the Quran but as long as he's alive yes you can be good to him you can help him you can give him charity you can take care of him help him in normal work all good there's no problem at all helping a non-muslim friend or a colleague or a teacher with money with with whatever Allah has given you facility but the best help is doing dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah give him hidayah and the best 
you can do is deliver the message of Islam, of the Quran, and the final message of Muhammad Sallallahu to your non-Muslim friends and colleagues. Hope that's the question. There's the next question on the YouTube from Sahul. I'm from India. Shall I trim my beard as my mom is scolding me for having it because of uneven growth? I'm just 19 years old, sir. I can trim and can't be without following my mom. Please help me, sir. So the question asked by Sahul is, can he trim his beard because mom is forcing him? Keeping a beard is fard, it's hadith of the Bukhari in which our beloved Prophet ﷺ said that do the opposite of what the pagans do, the Jews do. Trim your moustaches and let your beard grow. As far as there are two opinions, as far as what is the length of the beard is concerned, one group of scholars says grow means keep on growing without touching it. But according to Sheikh Nasir al-Albani and the other group of scholars, the right size of the beard is a fist. Because in the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. When he says that the Prophet said, do the opposite of what the pagans do, the Jews do, trim your moustaches and grow your beard. And then he takes a fist and below the fist, he cuts it. So the correct opinion according to me is that the size of the beard should be a fist. So if your mother is saying that trim, okay, very well, you can take a fist. Below the fist, what is there? You can trim. It is fine, it's permitted. Some scholars also say that if there are the hair coming on the side, it is permitted to trim. That's one opinion. So if your mother is telling you, my advice to be yes, see to it that if it's whatever the beard is above your fist, please trim it. That opinion is correct. There is one opinion that let it grow, don't trim at all. That is one group of scholars. But according to Shri Nasr Dalmani, it is a requirement that you should trim your, because there are various hadith, several hadith in which the Sabbath, they did trim their beard when it was longer than a fist. There is another question on the YouTube from Muhammad Masood Hussain. Sir, from which English book can I get the knowledge of life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? As far as the best English book available for the Sira of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the Rahik al Maktoum. The English translation is The Sealed Nectar. It's the biography of the Prophet written by Sheikh Safiya Rahman Mubarakpuri and he had got an award many years back for the best book written on the seer of the Prophet and then it was translated in many languages including English. So that is one of the good books, an authentic book. There are other books on the life of the Prophet by Tahir Ismail, also by Martin Lings, but the best is Rahik al -Muktum. This book is available, uh, you can go online and type it and, and you'll find it, inshallah. The next question on the WhatsApp. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. I am a dental surgeon, Dr. Nigar Sultana from Bangladesh. Alhamdulillah, I do niqab, cover my body and face also except eyes. Does Islam allow a Muslim girl to study in a medical university for post-graduation purpose when male and female study together and do the clinical work such as, such as patient counseling treatment services and so on. 
is there any restriction to give treatment services to the male patient? I have a dental clinic where I treat only female patients. I want to study for post-graduation degree, but the university has no separation system of male and female. What can I do for my higher study and post-graduation? Please give me your valuable opinion. Dr. Nigar Sultan, who is from Bangladesh, is a dentist. And she says that she observes hijab, she does niqab, she covers her face except the eyes. She's asking the question that can a Muslima enroll herself for post-graduation in a medical university where there's no segregation of sexes. But natural, for education, the best education is in a single sex school. That girls should go to an only girls school and boys should go only to a boys school. Whether it be schooling, whether it be college, whether it be university, it's the best. And scientific research has shown in several places, including the research done in UK, that the performance of a single sex school was far better than a co-ed school. When in co-ed school, the girl and the boy is more involved in trying to impress the opposite sex than to study. So research says that studying in a single sex school, this research is done by non-Muslim. The results are much better. But Islamically, for hijab reasons, best is to study in a single sex school. Even when you go to a college and university, the best is to study in a single sex school. But coming to your question, that if you want to do specialization, a post-graduation in dentistry, and there is no dental college, which has segregation of the sexes, so can you enroll yourself? Is it permissible? And there may be times where you have to interact with your colleagues, for example, patient counseling, you have to share the same patient, take his history. I, being a doctor, I'm aware of it. Is it permissible? The best is to go to a single sex college or university, whether it be a medical college. But if you don't have any, it is permissible on the condition that you take care of your hijab. Since you say that you are doing full hijab and wearing a kaab, alhamdulillah, that's very good. That is one part of it. But besides the hijab of the clothes, you should see to it that you being a dentist student, as you rightly said, you may have to interact with your colleagues while taking the history of the patient or many other reasons. Now when you interact, see to it, you unnecessarily do not interact with the opposite sex unless it's required. And whenever it's required, see to it when you interact, you lower your gaze. See to it when you talk, you should not be too complacent in your voice as the Quran says in sorry, Azumur to the wife of the Prophet. Be not too complacent in your voice lest in the opposite person, in his heart is a disease. So when you talk, see to it that you do not modulate too much or do not laugh or higgle and too much do giggling which is there in normal universities. So if you take care, control of your speech, you see to it that you lower your gaze, you see to it to interact only when required, you see to it that you maintain a distance, all this hijab, hijab of the clothes, hijab of the eyes, hijab of the language, hijab of the word, all put together, if you do, it's totally permissible. See to it, you are never alone with a Nahmeram man ever. Either you are with your other colleagues who are female, along with them, it's possible, but never alone. Because I have been to a medical college and I studied, there are the atmosphere of a medical college compared to dentistry is much more worse. And there are opportunities for doing many harams. So you have to take care of that because many a times you have to stay in the hospital overnight and you have to take care of patients. This atmosphere for the co-ed education is very vulnerable. Therefore, you have to take a precaution. If you take a precaution, it's permissible. You can enroll. See to you to take precaution. And you maintain your hijab, inshallah, once you get your post-graduation, you also ask the question, is it permissible for a doctor to treat the opposite sex? The best is a male doctor should treat the male, a female doctor should treat the female doctor. This is the normal norm. But if a lady is sick and if, the, if she has a heart problem and there is no lady heart specialist, she can very well go to a male doctor. But when she goes to a male doctor, there should be a third person, there should be a female nurse, the hijab should be maintained. In this condition, Islam gives permission that a doctor can examine 
and look at the female patient for treatment is permissible and the female is allowed to be with the namaram as long as there is there is another lady or a maram along it's permissible similarly in your case you said that you prefer treating only female patient as a dentist that is the best but can you treat male patient if there are other male dentists to take care of them why should you treat not at all but if there's an emergency and there's no one else and if a male patient comes and if he has a toothache and if he's really dying of pain and if you have to give treatment no one else that's permitted as long as you take care of your hijab he takes care of his hijab you have someone else in the room when you're treating but generally a male doctor taking care of the male patient and a female doctor taking care of the female patient is the best and we in Bombay we had a United Islamic aid so we had a field clinic and every day we used to treat approximately 200 patients so we had two doctors one was a female doctor one was a male doctor the female doctor took treated only the female patient the male doctor treated only the male patient the children they had option to go to any of the two but the adults we had this policy though the treatment was free it was air conditioned we had good qualified doctors but we saw to it that we maintained the islamic hijab so the best is male treating a male and a female treating a female but in emergency cases where there's no option or you don't have a specialist in that field it is permitted here for treating patient this in this situation an opposite sex can give the treatment hope that answers the question the next question from the whatsapp Muhammad Mastan from Madurai Tamil Nadu India is living a luxurious life and having 10 or more very expensive cars living in a mansion of rupees 20 crores haram in Islam can a person live a luxurious life if he made money from halal businesses and is also spreading Islam and is also helping poor people with half from his whole earnings and more than that a similar question is also asked by Muhammad Shebud Alam he is also from Tamil Nadu India mashallah both are from Tamil Nadu India is it permissible in Islam to aspire to become the richest man in the world through halal ways both the questions are similar as far as the first question is concerned that is it permissible in Islam for a man to have 10 very expensive cars and own a mansion of 20 crore rupees 20 crore rupees is uh, equal to 200 million rupees so in terms of dollars it will not be a lot it will be a few million dollars uh, uh, less than 3 million dollars and he said that is it permissible for a person to live a luxurious life if his earnings are from halal earnings from halal businesses and he is doing dawah he is giving charity half of his earnings is giving charity is it permissible and the second question is can a person wish to be the richest man in the world through halal earnings as far as is it permitted for a person to wish to be a richest man through halal earnings it's permissible but the question is once you become a richest man will you be able to pass the test is a different question because the beloved prophet Muhammad said it is easier for a poor man to go to jannah than a rich man because if you're a poor man you don't have to pay zakat if you're a rich man you have to pay zakat then you have to give charity so it is permissible for a person to pray or wish to become the richest man in the world through halal earnings and the best example is Prophet Suleiman Ali Salam. Prophet Solomon, may Allah be pleased with him, he prayed to Allah that give me a dominion which is the best and you will not give that to anyone after that. He not only wished to have the best and the richest kingdom, he prayed to Allah that don't give anyone better than that. He was a prophet of God. He passed, he asked for something, Allah gave him. And there are other examples. And 
But he was a messenger of God. He passed the test. For a normal human being, the more richer you are, the more difficult is the test. Is it permissible? Yes. Coming to the first questioner. That can a person own 10 very expensive cars and a mansion of 20 crore rupees, which is less than $3 million. Now, everything is subjective. If the person is a billionaire, then owning 10 very expensive cars, very expensive cars means, you know, very expensive means $100,000, maybe at least 75 lakh rupees. 10, okay, if the billionaire, okay. But if a person who is earning $1,000 a month, and if he says, I want to buy a car of $50,000, it would be sarf. But if a person who owns a thousand dollar a month and he says I want to own a car of five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, that's acceptable. But owning a fifty thousand dollar car or a hundred thousand dollar car, it's a sarf. Similarly, if a person is owning ten thousand dollars, then then if he says I want to own a car of fifty thousand dollars, that may not be sarf. Everything is subjective. So the basic rule that can you wish to be the richest man or can you earn in the halal way? and earn expensive things. Point number one is your earnings should be halal. And both the questioners are that. Point number one, your earnings should not be haram. Point number two, you should not purchase with that halal money anything which is haram. Or do not do any activity which is haram. Point number two. And the third, you should not do israf. And the fourth, minimum, give your zakat. So there are minimum four criteria required and more will come later on. Number one, is that your earning should be halal then you can wish to be the richest man you can be a billionaire you can you can even be a multi-billionaire the earning should be halal number two with that money don't buy anything haram don't use it for haram activities anything number three see to it that you don't do israf and number four see to it you give minimum zakat coming to the question the first question that can you own 10 expensive cars? Yes. If he's a billionaire, he can. 10 very expensive cars. But you said that can he own a mansion of 20 crore rupees? No, 20 crore rupees is very small. It's very less. 3 million dollars. The 10 expensive cars, very expensive cars, would be equivalent to a mansion. So when a person owned 10 expensive cars, it will be costing somewhere close to 10 crore rupees. The mansion, if you go to a city like Bombay, with 20 crore rupees, you can't get a mansion. You can get a good apartment. Mansion means a big villa, you will require a few hundred crores. So maybe your judgment was not right. Yes, you can have a mansion in the village. But if you are living in a village, what will you do with 10 expensive cars? People want expensive cars, they stay in a city, so that they can utilize it and show to the people or go on the highway. Anyway, your basic question was that can you buy 10 expensive cars or a very expensive mansion, whether it is 100 crores or 200 crores or 10 million dollars or 100 million dollars. Yes, if his capacity of earning is there. So what is israf for one may not be israf for the other. Like I said, a person earning 1000 dollar a month, for him even buying a 50,000 dollar car is israf. But for a millionaire earning a million dollar a month, for him to buy a 100,000 dollar car, not one, ten, it's not a saraf. As long as the earning is halal, as long as he's not doing any haram thing with his money, not buying or doing haram activity, as long as he gives his zakat, as long as he's not doing israf. So israf is subjective. Similarly with a mansion. If you're earning a lot and if you're part of your income, you're buying a mansion, no problem. But the second paragraph what you ask, that if you are giving 50% charity, that itself solves most of the problem. If he's very rich, his earning is halal, he's spreading dawa and giving 50% of his earnings in charity. If this is the case, then alhamdulillah, as long as he takes care that he does no, he's earning halal, he's doing dawa, he's giving 50% charity, but natural zakat plus 50% charity, he only takes care, israf also will not come because he gives 50% charity, only take the only case you should take is should not use his money for any haram activity. But the chances that you get such people who are billionaires and giving 50% of the income in charity is very negligible. Yes, there are people who are giving more than 50% of the earnings in charity. I know many. 
there are people but very few a very small negligible percentage but the moment you start earning and always say that a charity depends on a percentage for example a poor man who is earning a thousand dollar a month if he, if he gives hundred dollar charity every month he is far superior than a person who earns a million dollar a month and gives ten thousand dollar every month as charity the person who is earning a million dollar and is giving ten thousand dollars every month in charity he is only giving one percent of his income the person who is earning a thousand dollar and giving hundred dollar every month he is giving ten percent of his income in charity that means he is ten times much better than the person who earns billion dollar a month so that's the reason there is no harm in wishing to be the richest man but the test will be strong which will be stronger for you to have your nafs you say okay fine i'm already giving ten thousand dollars who's giving ten thousand dollars a month i'm giving but allah is giving a million dollar a month so ten thousand dollars is only one percent very small amount his zakat should be bigger than that <laughs> well if you earn a lot and you keep on storing you have to give 2.5 percent person on the billion dollar keeps on accumulating within few years he'll be having tens of millions of dollars hundred million dollar so if you give ten thousand dollars per month per year become hundred thousand dollars that will be less than his zakat also it will be haram so minimum you have to give is 2.5 percent of his saving the person who is earning a million dollar a month his zakat only will be more than ten thousand dollars a month and plus he has to give additional charity so praying to be the richest man is no problem you should take care of the things i mentioned and if you are a person who is giving 50 percent of his income in charity then owning the expensive cars no problem everything is subjective it's not the amount it is for what thing you're doing for example a person who's earning a thousand dollar a month if he buys a fifty thousand dollar watch it's israf because car is more expensive fifty thousand dollar even if you buy the ten thousand dollar watch ten times the salary it's israf for the other rich person who's earning a ten thousand dollar a month and if you buy the ten thousand dollar watch no problem so everything is subjective like for example in the gulf countries air condition is a necessity even for the poor man even in the jail in the central jail in the gulf countries we have a condition in india it's a luxury in most parts of india so what is the necessity there in one part of the world in the other part it may it may be a luxury so everything is subjective as long as it does not fall in the category of israf because allah says in the quran in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 25 26 27 that all those who are spendthrifts who are extravagants in expenditure they are brothers of the devil hope that answers the question the next question assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my name is muzammil ayub and i am from kashmir can a girl preach as adaya of islam through social media by staying in full hijab a similar question is asked assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh i am shazia pathan a homemaker from london uk is it permissible for a muslim woman to do dawa to a non muslim male can a muslima give a talk in a mixed gathering of males and females where non mehram males are also present the two question posed were the first is that can a muslima be a dai of islam and can she do dawa on the social media in full hijab and the second question is can a muslima give a talk in the public wearing hijab in a mixed gathering of male and female is it permissible and can a muslim do dawa to a non muslim male i will answer both the questions together the basic rule is generally as a general rule a male should do dawa to a male and a female should do dawa to a female as a general rule there are exceptions but generally 
a male should do dawa to a male and a female should do dawa to a female. As far as dawa is concerned, the question posed was on the social media. Can a Muslim do dawa on the social media doing full hijab? And the second question was that in a public gathering, a mixed gathering, can a woman give a public talk in a mixed gathering of male and female where there are non marams also in the public? First, we'll come to the dawa on the social media, then we'll come to in the public, one to one, or in a public place. In social media, there are various different ways where you can do dawa on social media, depending upon which type of social media you're talking about. Everything has its own speciality. Are you talking about a website? Are you talking on the internet? Is it a Facebook? Is it on the WhatsApp? Is it on the YouTube? Is it on the Instagram? Is it on the Pinterest? Is it on the Twitter? Is it on the Tumblr? Is it on Snapshot? Each has its own pros and cons while doing dawa. And each has its own restriction as far as ladies are concerned. In general, if you have to divide the types of dawa you can do social media, you can broadly classify into four categories in the main dawa. There are others also. Number one can be as a text, text on the social media or on the print media, text, mainly text with nothing but text, it didn't matter. Second, so as far as text is concerned, where there is nothing else besides text, a lady has no restriction as long as the matter she's speaking is within the boundaries of Islam. As long as she doesn't say anything in the text material, which is haram, it is permitted. There's no restriction. A lady can do with the lady, a lady can do with the gent, a gent can do with the lady, gent with, as long as only one way traffic is concerned. She can write a book. She can write an article, she can mention a blog, I'm talking about one way. She can write an article in the newspaper, article in the magazine, article, she can write a book, she can write an article on the blog, she can mention an article maybe on the Twitter. If it's a one-way traffic, lady can do to a lady, lady can do a gent, a gent can do to a gent, a gent can do to a lady, there is no restriction as long as the content is Islamic and isn't outside the boundaries of Islamic Sharia. The content should not be obscene, the content should not be haram. It's permissible. This is the first type. Print media, very safe, no problem. But in the print media, writing in the but while writing an article, you say, now I want to be a journalist. So I would like a lady saying, I want to go and take an interview of a male. Now she goes in the office and she takes an interview of a male in a closed door, no one is there. Only you and the person you're taking interview is a male, is a nam haram. The prophet said, if there are two nam haram, male and a female in a closed room, the third person is the devil. So writing is no problem, but if you say you want to be a journalist, okay, you take an interview only of the females, no problem. But a lady going and taking an interview of a gent, it is not Islamic. Why should she? There are other gents who can take. So writing article, no problem. Taking interview of a lady, no problem. Penning it down, no problem. Putting it on the website, no problem. As long as it's only text material. That is the first part. But secondly, if on the social media, along with the text, you're putting your photograph, if it's only ladies watching, no problem. But putting a photograph of a female, you know, wearing a hijab, hair is covered, but face is seen, putting a photograph, it's not advisable. Especially when it's a public platform, even the gent can see, so it is not permitted. There is one group of scholars who says it's permittable, but the authentic group and the group of scholars which are close to Quran Sunnah, it is haram and it's not permitted for a woman to put a photograph. Maybe she puts a photograph on the Twitter account, her photograph. Yes, she can put any other image of scenery, but if she puts her photograph on the Twitter account where she is texting, okay, texting is fine. In many social media, you can have uh, account which only you can allow people to come in. For example, you say that you're a girl, you want to have a particular on the Twitter or on the Facebook and it's a private page, you only allow ladies to come, no problem. But even in such cases, please don't you put your photograph because you don't know there can be a male who can come in the guise of a woman, you may not know. So if, when you're going on a public platform, even though you're encouraging only females to come in, you cannot put your photograph. You can write text, no problem. 
But putting a photograph is not advisable, even if you are very careful of seeing to it that you only allow ladies to come. A gent can come. It's a open internet. You cannot, with all your ability, you cannot see to it that restrict the high throws. Taking that precaution, okay, you allow only ladies. When you're interacting, chatting on the social media or on the WhatsApp or on the Twitter, see to it that chatting male with male is allowed, female with female allowed, but unnecessary a female with a male doing dawa, it is not advisable. Yes, there are some people asking question to a scholar and that scholar is answering on the Twitter is permissible if it's a male, but chatting one to one, how are you, this, that, and giving reply on the spot and all. This is not advisable. It should not be done. We know many a time that there are many sites which are catering to do dawah to the non-Muslims. And the female Muslim, Muslima, is chatting with a non-Muslim. How are you? And they're trying to do dawah. Even though they cannot see your face, there's no question of hijab because their face is not seen. They're only chatting. So there's no question of hijab. You, you can even type without wearing a hijab. But... When you are talking, unnecessarily talking to an opposite sex is not required. That's in an emergency if you do, it's permissible. But generally, let the male do dawa to the male, the female to female. So this is the first type as far as testing is concerned. One way traffic like book, article, printing material, no problem at all. Even on the social media, if it's one way, but chatting is not advisable, if it's a group, See to it that you don't put your images, your photographs, it is safe. That's the first criteria talking about text and print. The second would be maybe graphics. A lady may be very good in, in graphic designing. So maybe she puts an ayat of the Quran and has a good design behind it, a good scenery. Or she puts hadith of the Prophet and she puts it onto the social media, that's permitted. So she's using her graphic skills in designing. As long as she's not utilizing a photograph or not doing anything haram, she graphically designs the post very well, whether it be on the Pinterest or whether it be on the Facebook. But see to it that that graphic is not, it's not involving any haram activity. If she's posting it, whether on the Pinterest, whether on the Facebook, you can also now post on the Twitter. There are various options available now on the Instagram. So the second category will be graphic designing or using your skills or animation, as long as it doesn't break the rule of Sharia, there is no interaction with opposite sex, this second type is also permissible. Now coming to the third type, which is audio, your voice. We know in Islam that voice is, the voice of women does not come in the aura, normally. So the question is that can a woman give lectures on the audio. There are two views. One group says, okay, no problem, women can give audio because not the aura. The other group, which is more close to Quran Sunnah, says that a woman should not give lectures even to the gents. And I agree with the second view. Because when you're giving a lecture, you're, you're modulating your voice. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Azab to the wife of the Prophet, that do not be too compassionate in your voice, lest the other person, there may be a disease in his heart. So imagine the Ummu Hatul Mu'mineen, who was so pure, for them Allah puts a restriction that do not be too compassionate in your voice, otherwise in the other person there may be a disease in his heart. Imagine all the wives of the Prophet are the mothers of the believers, yet Allah puts that condition. So similarly, a Muslim are giving lecture to the Muslim woman or to the non-Muslim woman is perfectly fine. But a Muslim woman giving lecture to a non to a Namera male, it should be avoided. Talking is permissible, as I told in my earlier answer. Talking, seeing to lowering your gaze, if, if it's required. Unnecessary, no. But giving a public lecture to be effective. You have to model it. You cannot say, I am talking about Islam. Islam has got five pillars. The first is Salah. The first is Tawheed. The second. It will not be effective. You have to model it. <laughs> Even when you are speaking with the ladies, you have to model it. You can't be, you know, without modulation. So, if a woman gives a lecture, only to the woman, no problem. 
she should see to it that she does not publicize her audio on the social media. And as far as my wife is concerned, though she knows very well that voice is not the part of aura of women, she never had an audio recording. She never encouraged audio recording, no video recording. She always gives lectures in, 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 to the ladies, one-to-one -one in gatherings of 100,000 people, no problem. But always audio and video recording was prohibited. Lately, since last year because of pandemic, where people, all the on-site lectures stopped, there were no gatherings, you can't have gatherings, you can't have 1,000, can't even have 100, can't even have 50. So then I coaxed and told her that voice is not part of aura, why don't you give on the social media? So on the Zoom, she gave lecture to the lady, but she saw to it that she did not put the video on, only audio. Because with all your restrictions, though when you are giving on the Zoom, you have a control who is coming in. You may never know a gent may come posing as a lady. So that is the reason when she was giving audio lectures, she had PPT. PowerPoint position, that's good. You can have scenery, you can have graphic designers on graphic design, but avoid video. Even if you allow only ladies, you may not know who will break that barrier. So, if you are giving a lecture only to, audio, to the ladies, it's mentioned on the poster, on the social media, that this talk is exclusively for the ladies. And then it says in the bottom, gents, may also get reward if they invite their female relatives for this talk. Indirectly telling them, okay, you can get reward by inviting, you know, maybe your wife, your daughter, your sister, your mother to the program, no problem. But it's only for the ladies. And if a gent breaks the barrier, you don't want them to come, fine, it's his fault. And that time if you're giving audio speech and if there is a modulation, that's his problem, you're not going out of the way to give a lecture to a gent. So, in, when a lady is doing dawa on the, uh, on the social media, it is preferable that the social media is restricted only to ladies. Though there is one group of scholars which says there is no problem, there is no restriction, etc. But I agree with the other group which is more strict and more close to Quran Sunnah, that even the audio, though it is not part of the aura, it should not be done freely to the mixed gathering, it should exclusively be done to female to female. So in the second category of audio, you can, because whether you have a talk, audio talk on the YouTube or on the Zoom or on the Facebook, you can convert the visual into, instead of the video recording, to a PPT, a PowerPoint presentation or a graphic design, uh, or maybe a graphic plate comes in. If you are quoting a verse of the Quran, so the Quranic verse comes. You can mention the points in brief. So it's more interactive. And fine, you can ask questions. The lead is asking questions. So you can use the Zoom call for a live talk or you can have a video conferencing. You can use the social media platform. But see to it that the visual is put off. So this is the third category where restriction is very important. And the last type in the social media is the video. As far as video is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, that if a lady is doing hijab, and not covering the face. If she believes that doing niqab is not fard. And even I too believe in the opinion of Shikna Surah Al-Bani that covering the face is not a fard for a woman. But that does not mean she can give a talk in front of a mixed gathering, male and female. Whether it be physically or whether it be on the video in the social media. Because though the niqab is not fard, but giving a talk then her face is seen and the men are watching her, whether it be a live talk or whether it be on the social media, whether it be on the Facebook or whether it be on the YouTube. This, according to me, is not permitted, though there is one group of mainly the Western group who say it's permitted, but I disagree with them. I agree with those group of scholars. You know, the, and the list of scholars is, is big. The Bin Baz, Sheikh Nasr Dalbani, Sheikh Uthaymi, all of these, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreel, they are very strict and they say that for a woman to give a talk in front of a woman, not allowed at all. Even audio. They said audio also, if, if the audio recording is shown, only in case of necessity, otherwise they should not, they should, uh, uh, audio recording should only be 
broadcast to a lady, but not to a meat gathering. And I agree with that view. So, on video, she cannot say that I will restrict only the gents. She will say, I'll have a Zoom call, I'll restrict only to the female. It is not possible at all. That barrier can easily be broken. That is the reason I would suggest that a Muslima should not use video recording on any of the social media platform. Because how can you restrict? It's very difficult. Anyone easily can break that barrier. That is the reason best is only audio to ladies. If a gent comes in, okay, the voice is not the aura and it's his fault, he's breaking the barrier. But if you're showing visual, there are high chances they can come in and you are showing your face and that becomes a higher level of thing which is not permitted. Similarly, in a mixed gathering, can a woman give lecture in a mixed gathering where there are namaram, even if she is doing hijab and opening the face, not allowed. Now coming to the second question, that can she give lecture wearing a naqab? Now here, again there is difference. That can a lady wearing a naqab give a lecture in a mixed gathering? There is one group of scholars says, even if a lady wears a naqab, in a mixed gathering, she cannot give a lecture. One group of scholars says, she can give. I would not say it is haram, but I would say it is best to avoid. Even if a lady coming in a naqab in a mixed gathering in front of hundreds of people, whether a naam haram, I would not recommend. I would not say it is haram, but I would not recommend. I do lean towards the first group of scholars who say that even in a mixed gathering, if she wears naqab, her voice modulation is there, which will be a fitna. And why should she come in the front? There are other gents who can come. In front of ladies, no problem. With naqab, without naqab, without hijab. If she shows the hair also, if it's only ladies, no problem. So, in general rule, a man, a male does dawa to a male, a female does dawa to a female. I know many countries where I've gone. I'm going to a dawa center. There is a Muslim boy who's doing dawa to a non-Muslim girl in a closed room. There's a discussion room, very small, hardly 25 square feet or 50 square feet. And one to one spending us together, it's haram. A beloved prophet said, if two nahmeram, male and female nahmeram are in the same room, the third person is a devil. So how can you say you can do dawa? It's very common, especially in western countries and many other parts of the world. You cannot break the hijab level. Normally let the male do to the male one to one female to a female, in writing no problem, in text no problem, in print material no problem as long as it's not chatting on the social media. Print is the safest, second would be graphic designing no problem, third would be audio, okay restrict only to audio and see to it that don't involve the male. If they break in, okay that's their problem, they are doing something wrong. But as far as live lectures or the videos for the women, she should exclusively do only amongst the women and she should not use any of her photographs any of a video on the social media. Please, it is, I agree with those group of scholars, they say that women should not use her photograph or her video anywhere on the social media, on any of the platform, whether it be internet, whether it be website, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Twitter, whether it be on the WhatsApp, whether it be on the DP, her photograph and her video should not be used at all. And one very important advice, which we also followed in our school. That if a lady is taking photograph, she can very well share the photograph only with the family members. That's it. It's very common that there are females who are doing hijab. Very good. They take out photograph among their friend and they give it to their friend. Okay. It's allowed for a female to share the photograph with a friend. But what if that photograph is seen by her brother, by her father, because the brother of your friend is not your mehram. No, no, she's very Islamic, she'll not show. My advice is never share your photograph, even with your friend. The only person you can share your photograph is with your family members, because if you give it to your sister, your sister will show it to the brother, no problem. So even if you're following strict hijab, please make a note that don't share your photograph with your female friends also, whether it be on the WhatsApp, whether it be on the mobile phone. I would not say it is haram because if you are so confident that, okay, my, my friend has my photograph, but she will not show to anyone. 
okay but if she shows to someone who is the cause of breaking the hijab you so my advice is not to give even to your friends if you are so confident that she is a very good friend it may yet come in the makru category why take the risk so when you take a photograph on your mobile see to it it remains only in the family members it doesn't grow up and go out in whatsapp group of friends i'm giving only to my female friend and she will share she may not be that strict so this is the advice as far as the dawa for the ladies are concerned when they're doing on the social media or whether they're doing live one to one hope that answers the question The next question, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam. I am from Bangladesh and I am a student. Is it permissible for a Muslim to eat the food that the non-Muslim worshippers prepare during the holy festivals? Regarding the question, is it permissible for a Muslim to eat the food prepared by the non-Muslim during the festivals? This type of food that is prepared in festivals by the non-Muslims are of two types. One food is the food on which the name of somebody else besides Allah is taken. For example, in Christianity, many a times in the church they give bread and wine known as the communion or the Eucharist. In communion, they give the bread and the wine saying that this represents the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Now this again on this food is the name taken of somebody else besides Allah. They consider Jesus as God, peace be upon him, knows Billah. In Hinduism, they have the prasad. Prasad is normally an offering given to the gods. You know, they give offering of flour, they give offering of food. It may be in, in, the, in the type of sweet rice or maybe fruits, maybe coconut. So they give it to God and then after that they give it to the devotees and to their friends. This prasad, the name of God is taken. So this type of food in festivals where the name of any other besides Allah, the name of the false God is taken, all the saints are taken. Allah is very clear cut in the Quran in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 173. In Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 3. In Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 145. And Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 115. Allah says, Hurrimat alaykumul maitutu waddamu walamul kinzir. Wama uhilla li gherin labbi. That forbidden for you for food are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine. And any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. So here Allah is very clear cut in no less than four different places. That besides blood, dead meat, the flesh of swine, that is pork. Any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken, it is prohibited. So if during festival, during Christmas or during any Christian festival or during a Hindu festival, whether it be Ganpati, they are, they are giving prasad on Lord Ganesh. All these things, this food is totally haram, you cannot have it. The second type of food is that people make food for Christmas, sweets, maybe the name of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, not taken. Or they prepare food for Diwali or for Hindu festival where it is not part of prasad. Can you have this food? So if a non-Muslim friend or a neighbor is giving you sweets for Diwali or sweets for Christmas, can you have it? Under this condition also, you, you should not take it. Why? Because when you accept sweets for Christmas, that means you are agreeing with the festival of Christmas. Now, Christmas is a festival celebrated by the Christians. They say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the begotten son of God. And he was born on the 25th of December. That means they are saying that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a begotten son of God. He was born to Almighty God on the 25th of December and Jesus is God. So what you are doing, you are agreeing with them. The moment you take the sweet, that means you are agreeing. It's a good day. So not only are you not correcting them, 
you are being you are giving shahada that knows billah allah begot a son on the 25th of december which is shirk and they believe jesus is god so only by taking the sweet to becoming party to that you cannot attend the functions is a christmas party you cannot go there no i'm only going because you know i want to be good to them i want to be kind to them so it's not allowed at all allah is very clear cut in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 2 that you help one another in righteousness and piety watanu watanu bir wa taqwa that help one another in bir and taqwa in righteousness and piety wala taun but do not help each other in sin and transgression that means helping one another in sin and transgression is prohibited now when you go to a christmas party you are agreeing with them that the christmas is good you cannot say i don't want to break the heart this is totally wrong in islam you cannot support them for something which is wrong similarly when you are taking food which they are giving sweets for christmas or sweet for diwali you are agreeing with it so even food on which god's name is not taken but it is part of a festival and almost all the festival most of the non muslim festival they go against the sharia either there is shirk in it or there is some other element to it which is against the sharia so not only should you eat the food on which god's name is taken whether it be the communion the bread and the wine or whether it be the prasad you cannot even take the sweets given for diwali or for ganpati or for christmas it's haram neither can you attend the function all these are prohibited and a muslim should stay away from them there can be a situation where someone calls you from a christmas party and then you say okay fine they have called me to give a lecture so i say fine i'll go to give a lecture i'll give a lecture on jesus is not god so if i'm going to give a lecture i'll see to it i don't do anything haram i don't have any haram food huh? i'm going there and i'm telling to everyone i'm giving a public talk there to everyone it's very clear cut and i'm telling them that jesus is not god but he is the messenger of god no problem such situation are very rare making it very evident to everyone that you disagree with the christmas so if you go there to give a lecture and do dawa to them not one to one you can't say okay i'm going to dawa to one of them but, but the others will think okay you're agreeing with the party so you can't go to a party and say okay if you're, if you're called to give a public lecture so then everyone entering the party knows very well that you are coming there and your message is very clear cut no i'm going i'll go dawa to just two of my friends you can do dawa to those two of the friends any other time why in the christmas party why in the diwali party so it's very important that you follow the rules of the islamic sharia but if you're called as a guest speaker you're giving to everyone it's permitted you take precaution that you don't eat anything haram and you don't do any haram act there but giving in the message of islam and calling them towards islam is permitted hope that answers the question <clears throat> sheikh shafiullah working for flipkart and i am a student from kolkata india please give your views about darus salam publications i don't know much about it and i bought sahih bukhari from them online and planning to buy more in future Sheikh Shafiul has asked a question that what, that how is Darul Salam publication? He wants to know. He bought Sahih Bukhari from them, and should he continue buying from them? Darul Salam publication is one of the largest publication of English authentic books on Islam, on authentic English books on Islam. Darul Salam publication it started in. 1986 and the name of the owner is Sheikh Abdul Malik Mujahid he's a close friend of mine and I'm associated with Darul Salam for several years for several decades rather it's about 35 years old it started 1986 it's 35 years old and the main intention was to give to the public authentic books books which are authentic because many a time when you go to an Islamic bookstores you know some of the bookstores the matter in it it is an islamic book but it's an islamic matter it may be story from here and there it may not be based on the quran it may not be based on authentic hadith there may be stories and there may be books written by unauthentic people 
so his main mission was to big authentic books and number two print in good quality his main two purpose of starting the darussalam publication was that it should be authentic it should not have material which is against the quran and sunnah and number two it should be of quality the main headquarters is in riyadh and today mashallah after 35 years they have got branches in i think more than 20 25 countries and the main books are in three languages english urdu and arabic but they have publication in more than 25 languages only the quran they have published in 26 different languages but the main focus is english urdu and arabic and they have published more than 1400 books in the last 35 years and one of the mission was to translate the quran in different languages which they have translated more than 25 languages even the english translation they thought would that they they checked it they have printed the noble quran and they have also translated the tafsir of the quran by ibn qasir ibn qasir originally is an english language they had a team of scholars mashallah darus salam has a big team of scholars and they have got many people who are researchers and scholars so this tafsir of ibn qasir was supervised by sheikh safir rahman mubarakpuri sheikh safir rahman mubarakpuri he supervised this team of scholars and what they did that when they translated the tafsir ibn qasir they call it the abridged version in ibn qasir when he gives his he gives the views of different scholars and some scholars their views was based on zaif hadith so this darus salam publication with the team of scholars they removed those opinion which were based on zaif hadith and which were authentic so in the abridged version of tafsir ibn qasir you are safe that if not 100% almost all the views are based on quran and sahih hadith it's good the normal full version of ibn qasir has got views of scholars which may not be based on authentic hadith so they remove those views so this is a very good work they have done so they have, their work on the basis of tafsir of the quran is very good mashallah so they published this in 10 different in 10 volumes the translation of tafsir ibn qasir the abridged version they also did a great deal of work in hadith they took up the task of translating say bukhari was available in other translations by other publication but the english was very poor so they did a new translation of say bukhari and this is much better than the earlier one then they translated say muslim then they made summarized version of say bukhari summarized version of say muslim then what they did is they translated the full kutub as-sitta besides bukhari and muslim they translated sunan abu daud uh, Jamia Tirmidhi, Sunan Nisa'i, Ibn Majah, all the Qutb al-Sitta. Then even Musnad Ahmad. So mashallah, they have done a great work. This was not done in the English language. It took many years. A lot of money was spent. And furthermore, they even translated the Rahik al-Maktum, the question asked to be earlier. That they translated the book of Sheikh Sabir Amar Mubarak Puri from Arabic to English. Called it the Sreel Nectar. And... it's available they also did the jami kamil the jami kamil is published in arabic and now inshallah very soon the translation would be complete in the next maybe by ramzan or few months after that next year in 2022 it will be released alhamdulillah they have done a great work for the ummah and sheikh malik mujahid main purpose was to serve the ummah and he's done a lot and there are books on the seerah of the prophet and other topics on the pillars of islam and mashallah great deal of work and whenever they when they translate even the sunan abu daud majority of sahih hadith if the zaif they mention in the bracket so if you want to buy any books in english language or urdu or arabic you can safely when you buy from darus salam publication they authentic almost all their work there may be human error here and there but otherwise it's very safe to buy from this and at present they have more than 25 languages and besides books now they started electronic they started toys for the children they have gone into other fields trying to diversify and alhamdulillah sheikh abdul malik mujahid he's a close friend of mine and and he has done a great service for the muslim ummah especially in the field of islamic knowledge and may allah subhanahu wa taala grant him the best 
of this world as well as the Akhirah. The next question on the WhatsApp. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I am a non Muslim politician. I live in Batu, Selangor, Malaysia. I've purposely not taken the name of the person. I want to convert to Islam, but majority of my political supporters oppose my conversion as I previously pledged to defend pork, alcohol, and gambling. What do you advise me to do? This non-Muslim brother of ours is a politician from Selangor, Malaysia. It is just maybe one hour drive from where I'm staying in Putrajaya. And this non-Muslim politician, I have purposely not taken his name, he says he wants to accept Islam. But most of his political supporters are saying because he defended alcohol, pork and gambling in the past, now he should not accept Islam. There is no such prohibition at all. I disagree with your, with your political supporters, whoever they are. In Islam, whatever sin you did in the past, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, the moment a person accepts Islam, all his previous sins are forgiven, irrespective of what the sin are. Even if you do the shirk, you did idol worship, you may have done, you may have gambled, you may have drank alcohol, you may have ate pork, whatever you did, the moment you accept Islam, all your previous sins are forgiven. In fact, <clears throat> in fact, the more further you were, for, you were away from Islam, the bigger sins you did, the moment you accept Islam, all this gets converted into positive points. That means the more wrong things you did, the moment you accept Islam and stop them, you will get a bigger reward. So my request to you would be that if you're interested in in accepting Islam. As long as you agree with two points, the minimum two requirement for any non-Muslim to accept Islam is, number one, is to agree that there is no God worthy of worship except Almighty Allah. Believe that there is no idol worship, idol worship is prohibited, and agree that you should not worship anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Point number two, that you believe that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger of Almighty God. If you believe in these two things, my request to you, brother, would be that accept Islam immediately. Even if you, in the past, maybe a few years back, you supported alcoholism, you supported eating pork, you supported gambling, no problem. But naturally, once you accept Islam, you will not support alcoholism, you will not support eating pork, you will not support gambling. In fact, I feel that if you convert to Islam, you revert to Islam, and you stop all these things, then inshallah, I feel that your vote bank will increase. Don't do it for the vote bank, please. But since your political supporters are telling you don't do it, my advice to you would, it will in, in fact increase your vote bank. Because in Malaysia, approximately 60 to 63 percent are Muslims. The non-Muslims are in the minority. You may be from a Chinese background or from a non-Muslim background, but naturally, but please don't do to increase your vote bank. This would be a wrong reason. But I'm giving a counter argument to your friends and supporters who are giving a wrong information. So my request to you would be that 
even if hypothetically it will ruin your political career no problem in the akhirah you will benefit it will not ruin but even if it does it will benefit you in the akhirah and a muslim accepts and a human being accepts islam for the akhirah irrespective of benefit here or not in the akhirah you will go to jannah inshallah so my request to you would be that if you agree in this two point believe that there is one god and no one is worthy of worship except allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you believe prophet muhammad is the messenger of Allah, you can very well in your Salam God, there are many Islamic organizations, you can go to any Muslim organization and say the Shada and accept, accept Islam. If you have any queries, if you have any questions, you want to ask personally from me, I'm just an hour's drive away from you. I'm staying in Putrajaya, you're most welcome. And if there's any way I can help you, it will be my pleasure. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> the next question Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum assalam My name is Zahid Hassan I am from Bangladesh Is hair transplant permitted in Islam? In hair transplantation what is done Is that if a person His hair is not growing in a particular area Or he has got bald patches So what does the doctor do? that he takes a follicle of hair from the part which has got good growth maybe at the back of his head or side of his head and he transplant in an area which is a bald patch or he takes a skin which contains the hair follicle and he transplants in a bald patch now in Islam the ruling is that you cannot change the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example if a woman has a hair and if she adds more hair to it, a prophet clearly prohibited. It's haram. You cannot change the creation. But in hair transplantation or hair transplant, the scholars, what they say, there is not change in the creation of Allah, but it is restoring back the creation of Allah. The hair growth was good, and for certain reason, it stopped. So it is either restoring of the creation of Allah or treating a disease there is a patch and the disease can be treated so this hair transplantation does not come in the category of changing the creation of Allah if you add another hair to a hair which you already have that is changing Allah's creation which is prohibited but hair transplant according to scholars is permitted and when this question was asked to Sheikh Muhammad Salih Uthaymin Sheikh Muhammad Salih Uthaymin May Allah have mercy on him That is hair transplantation allowed? He said yes, it's permitted because it is not changing the creation of Allah But it is restoring the creation of Allah Or it is It is uh, Curing the disease and it's permitted and and he said because there's a hadith in which angel comes and restores the hair of a bald person and what he's referring to there are two hadith in the Sahihain it's there in Sahih Bukhari volume number 4 hadith number 3464 and in Sahih Muslim volume number 7 hadith number 7431 the story is very long but in that incidence beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that the angel comes and asks a bald man that what you want? He says that I want my hair to be restored and he touches there and the hair is restored. So there is evidence. So based on this, hair transplantation is, is permitted and it is allowed. And if a person wants to do, there are various different methodologies. He can adopt any of the methodologies. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. My name is Suleiman from United Arab Emirates. I am the biggest fan of you, Dr. Zakir. Mashallah. May God bless you and protect you from all enemies, inshallah. I mean. My question. When Adam alayhi salam and Eve were living in heaven, 
God instructed them not to eat from the tree, but Satan deceived them to eat from that tree, which resulted in God cursing them and led them to this earth. When the mistake was done by Adam and Eve and not us, then why are we on this earth instead of being in heaven? Brother Suleiman from UAE has asked a question that Adam and Eve, they were instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they were in heaven, did not approach that tree. It's mentioned in the Quran, it's also mentioned in the Bible. But the Satan deceived them and they ate from that tree and which Allah sent them on the earth. But the brother said that, you know, Allah cursed them and all of us are here, we should have been in heaven. I think the brother is confusing between the story of the Bible and the Quran. This incident is mentioned in the Quran as well as the Bible. Overall, it is similar, but if you analyze, there is a great difference between both these stories. According to the Bible, the incident is the same. In the Quran and the Bible, it's mentioned that Allah told Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, that not to approach that tree. But in the Bible, it says, in Bible and Quran, both it says that they sat in time with them. But in Bible, it says that Eve tempted Adam. And because of Eve, Adam and Eve both ate the fruit from the tree and God cursed them. And mentioned in Genesis chapter number 3 that Almighty God says, You woman, you shall bear labor pains and bear birth in pain. So in the Bible, pregnancy is a curse. This is the details of the Bible. And the full blame is put on the woman that is Eve. And then it says that every human being is born in sin. Because Eve tempted Adam to eat the fruit. And both of them ate fruit. Allah curses them. They came on this heaven. And they came from heaven onto the earth. And because of that every human, is, every human being is born in sin. Now in the Quran there is a world of a difference. Outline is the same. Yes. Almighty God told Adam and Eve, may Allah be with them both. May Allah be peace with them both. Allah told them not to approach the tree. Satan tempted them. But the blame nowhere in the Quran is the blame put only on Eve. May Allah be peace with them. The blame is put on both. More than a dozen times they have mentioned this incident. The blame is put on both Adam and Eve, both of them. There is one place in the Quran in Surah Taha where it says only Adam is referred to. Peace be upon him. But as a whole, the blame is put equally on both of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them out from the heaven and puts them onto the earth. But here in the Quran it says that both of them asked for forgiveness. And Allah forgave them. So they asked for forgiveness. Allah forgave them and then after them they, they obeyed the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Islam, we don't have the concept of original sin. The Quran says, no bearer of burden can bear the burden of others. That means just because Adam and Eve made a mistake, we are not born in sin. It's wrong. That is the concept of the Bible. In Islam, every child is born sinless. He is born masum. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Mul, chapter number 16, verse number 2, Allazi khalaqal mawata wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of his good deeds. So, we are not born in sin at all. That's the concept of Christianity. That's also a false concept. If you really go into the detail, the Bible doesn't say that. But that's what is the teaching of the church. What the Bible says in Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, the soul that sin shall die. The iniquity of the father shall not be the, the iniquity of the father shall not be on the son. Neither the iniquity of the son shall be on the father. But if the son comes back to the straight path, he shall not die. So they are putting a full stop where there is no full stop. The soul that finished shall die. It's only the starting part of the verse. So even according to the true teachings of the Bible, there is no concept of original sin. That is the concept of the church so that they can control the masses. Anyway, coming back to the Quran. The Quran disagrees with it. Many places Allah says, the bearer of the burden, no bearer of burden can bear the burden of the others. So in Islam, 
we are not here because Adam and Eve, peace be upon him, made a mistake. This was, Allah tested them, they asked for forgiveness, Allah forgave them, they, he is a messenger of God, they will go to Jannah for sure. Now Allah is testing us. And the Quran says, no one, no human being shall enter Jannah without being tested. And Allah says in several places, Allah will test you with, with fear, with hunger, with, uh, with the loss of life. Sorry, Bakra chapter 2 verse 155, Allah will test you with your children, with your wealth. This is the test. So Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, they passed the test. Have we passed? We don't know. So now we are here undergoing a test. So to say that if Adam and Eve wouldn't have approached from the tree, approached the tree, wouldn't have come here, is totally wrong. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way of testing. Allah wants to test us. How would he have tested us? We don't know. We will be tested for sure. Without being tested, we cannot go to Jannah. This is one of the ways. So when we are born, we are born sinless. Allah has given the guidance. Now we have sent the last and final messenger. We have to follow the guidance given in the Quran, just say hadith. We will be tested and we are undergoing the test. What we have to do is see to it that we read the Quran, read the hadith, implement on it so that inshallah in the next life we go to Jannah. Hope that answers the question. Inshallah, we'll take the last question before we end the session. This is from the WhatsApp again. The question is from Kubra Fatima from India. I want to know about marriage proposals. Is it we who choose the spouse out of a free will or is it already the Qadr of Allah? Sister Fatima has asked the question that do we have a free will to choose our spouse or is it the Qadr of Allah? It is both. You may not know what is the meaning of Qadr of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a free will to every human being. But the free will is limited and is given the guidance in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that when you choose a life partner, you look for four things. Beauty, wealth, nobility and deen, that is virtue. And among this, deen and virtue is the best. If there was no free will, why would the Prophet say? The Prophet said, okay, whatever it is. The, your spouse is already there in the Qadr. Why are you choosing? It is our choice. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows in advance who you are going to choose. Allah knows that you may have option where there will be a beautiful girl coming. She may not be virtuous and you will marry her. Who is to blame? You are to blame. So Allah knows in advance and he wrote that you will not choose the religious girl. You will choose the beautiful girl. Or maybe you choose the religious girl who may not be beautiful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows in advance what you will be doing. So based on that, Allah writes in advance in the Qadr that you will be marrying so and so person. It's already written. But who's to blame? You. Allah is ilmi ghayb. So the choice is yours. So you have to take your utmost precaution and do your research and try and find the best spouse for you. There are four criteria. The Prophet said which people looking for beauty for the woman it will be choosing a life husband would be handsome wealth nobility and virtue deen. the choice is yours Allah knows what you're going to choose so Allah is also mentioned in the Qadr so both are there you will marry what is mentioned in the Qadr but why did Allah write Allah is ilme gab he has knowledge of the future so in advance he has mentioned in the Qadr so both are important but natural for you you have to follow the guidelines of the Quran and the Sai Hadith. Choose the right partner so that he will be your pathway to Jannah. Hope this answers the question. And this was the last question I could answer. We have run out of time. Till we meet, inshallah, three weeks from now. Next week would be handled by my son, Sheikh Farik. And after that, it is the fifth Saturday, which would be a break. So there will not be any session after two weeks. So three weeks from now, inshallah, on Saturday, 11 p.m. Malaysian time, uh, 6 p.m. that is Makkah time, and 3 p.m. GMT. Till then, Assalamu alaikum, warahmatullahi barakatuh, wa akhru dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.